Okay, shall we start? Mm -hmm. Welcome, everyone. After a long break, um, and um, so the, the the third part of the of the seminar this year is, um, I think, is going to be concerned with exploring this notion of creativity a little bit more. Um, we had so we, we we started the exploration of the idea of process by looking at um, how it relates to classical theory of being, the classical metaphysics of being, and basically try to uh, I basically try to say process philosophy has got a more interesting thing to offer than just to say uh, uh, that instead of the world consisting of uh, medium-sized dry goods, it, it consists of mi many-sized uh, wet goods, as it were. There is um, more to it. The, once you take the perspective of process philosophy, the, the whole philosophical question shifts and old distinctions don't really apply anymore and maybe new questions come up. Um, and so I think that that is what, what occupied us in, in the past. And then we try to examine this in, uh, in relation to uh, uh, classical philosophy, but also in relation a little bit. We started that, we maybe do more of it, in relation to uh, classical Chinese thought, so the idea of the Tao, and uh, to try to develop an anarchic, or to examine this, this uh, anarchic view of, of process and the ontological implications of it. Uh, and of course also looked at Bloch's theory of the, the dialectic, of a materialist dialectic, and how that, that is a kind of process thought. Um, but in all of these things, what, what has come up is the, the, um, the idea that there is a kind of, um, uh, at the heart of what process is, is a kind of spontaneity. Uh, an ontological spontaneity that uh, there can be new things and um, you know for people like Bloch uh, and, and other similar thinkers uh, also dissimilar thinkers with you know people like Dewey and uh, William James in the pragmatic tradition this idea that there is in, in the world something that we might call newness or novelty um, is, uh, is itself a new idea. It's an idea for which in, in, uh, in European thought, at least, there, there is not, uh, has not really been a real place. Um, Bloch always points out that, uh, that uh, Varro, who wrote the first uh, grammar of Greek, forgot to include the, the future case in uh, in, <laughs> in, in his description of the language. Yeah? Oh, future tense, sorry. So. Um, so this idea that there is something that we might call newness, something that wasn't there before, that is radically new uh, and uh, hasn't been there, uh, is, uh, is an idea that, that is actually itself quite, uh, it's been around now for 200 years or so, but is a relatively new idea itself. And um, it has to do with, uh, of course, with process, because the origination of the new is a kind of processual thing. Um, and, um, and it has to do with this concept of creativity. And so in order to, to, so if we want to develop a process philosophy, we've got to find a way to think about spontaneity. We've got to find a way to think about creativity. And that is what... Uh, what I'm concerned with now. To do that, uh, or to, to examine some, some proposals by, by different people um, around thinking about what this spontaneity is, and also how we can uh, make it part of our own thinking. Um, and I think maybe it will turn out that, uh, that again, as with the concept of process, that once you start to think seriously about creativity and spontaneity or the new, that um, again you find that a lot of things change. And a lot of things that we maybe assumed uh, quite to be self-evident uh, somehow uh, turn out to be more, more complex and new possibilities for thought open up. And one of the... Uh, 
Yeah, so one of the... Hi. Hello. One of the, way, one of the people who has done that um, isn't exactly a, th- a philosopher, but uh, a physicist, but of course also very philosophical, philosophically minded, David Bohm. And I just wanted to, uh, to today to discuss with you this paper that I sent around for pre-reading um, to get a sense of how, how he thinks about creativity. And then we can look at, uh, later on, we can look at, go, go back again to, to Taoism and to David Hall, who has also written about that in other publications. We can look at uh, Whitehead again himself. We can also look at... Um, some more applied things. I wanted to look at Adorno's paper on, on jazz, or his two, two articles on jazz, and on improvisation, um, and to see if, uh, if, let's say, the attempt to develop a philosophy of creativity is, is not also uh, an attempt to develop a philosophy of improvisation. That's a wide perspective, because improvisation can be taken into many directions. Um, not the least of which would be an, an ethical direction. So I think there is such a thing as an, an ethics of improvisation, which can be uh, an alternative to traditional views of ethics as having to be either based on the sense of duty or utilitarianism or uh, virtues. So uh, what that uh, improvised improvisational ethics, what that could amount to, is something that we would have to explore later on. But I think today should be around discussing this article to get in, into the experience of creativity. And you, of course, know a lot about it because you are an artist. I don't know if I'm doing it. You're doing it, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, but yeah, David Bohm certainly, certainly has a lot to say about it. So that's yeah, that's that's basically ah hi. So that's that's what I what I want to do. Now, um, a first a remark about the word creativity. I think we've already said this at some point. Um, it is a relatively late, very late invention. Of course, it is a perfectly uh, regularly formed word in English, but funnily enough, it doesn't really occur in the English language prior to the 1920s, and from there it spread into the other languages. And, uh, and funnily enough, also, which people don't know, the person who came up with the word is Whitehead. In his uh, 19, uh, what is it, 1928 text, 26 text, Religion in the Making. I think that's where he, he first uses his word creativity. Um, and from there on, it, it has spread and it's become so pervasive. I mean, by now we don't even think about this word as something that somebody invented at one point. There are three or four, I've checked this in the Oxford Dictionary, there are three or four occurrences of the word prior to the 1920s when it suddenly skyrockets and spreads across other languages as well. But, but they are always in the, in the context of the, the action of, of the creator thought. And so not um, as the ability of, of people or processes or, or organisms or other things to make something new that wasn't there before. That sense of creativity is uh, very recent. I think that is interesting. I think it's interesting to realize that a word that is so much part of our daily vocabulary, almost as much, I would say, as, for example, the word quality, which, of course, is an Aristotelian invention, um, you know, and and that that, that the language just has absorbed it, and it is... uh, it is obscured where it, where it comes from. It's not a technical philosophical term. Which work by Aristotle? Excuse me. Which work by Aristotle you just mentioned? Quality. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. But I'm talking about creativity. Yeah, um, yeah so that's, the, that's the, 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 the question for today. What is creativity? And... Um, 
I've given you this article to read by David Gorm, who, uh, is David Gorm familiar to you? No? I've read it now, but oh, yeah, not this, previously. No. Not previously, okay. David Gorm was a very interesting, uh, very interesting person, a physicist from America. He was professor, later, later in life, professor at Birkbeck. Um, and, um, but he was already, he was working on the atomic bomb project in, in Los Alamos in, uh, in, the, in the 1940s as a, as a young man. And um, he has had a huge influence in, not just in physics, but also outside of physics, especially, especially maybe even more, with this idea of what he calls the implicate order. Uh, there is it the book, yeah, you, you have it there, uh, Wholeness and the Implicate Order. So he, he, was, he was concerned to uh, not just uh, contribute to physics, but to also think uh, more philosophical questions. And especially what seems to have, uh, is important to him, and that's maybe a bit, a bit of an introduction to this essay on creativity, is um, the question of, of wholeness and fragmentation. And um, he, he sees, uh, he, he's very uh, concerned to show how we tend to, uh, in our thinking, we tend to fragment reality and then we tend to assign independent existence or reality to the fragments and then have to try to end up, to, to try to get things back together again, which doesn't work. Um, and he, he says, modern physics but also philosophy but the modern physics itself leads to a recognition that we have to turn this habit of mind around instead of fragmenting things we have to go we have to see our fragments as perspectives on a wholeness that um, cannot be conceptualized directly but that is present everywhere and in everything and he calls it the implicate order, or also the holographic order. So he has the idea that every, every point in reality, that's a very old metaphysical idea, every point in reality, as it were, contains the whole of the world, the whole of, the whole of everything there is within it, in what he calls a holographic sense. It's like, a, like, a, you know, like a, one of these holographic pictures that, in which you can appear to see the whole thing. Um, it, that is part of a physical theory that I can't say anything about. I, I, I don't uh, understand it. But, um, so but how's that different from Leibniz? It's very Leibnizian in a way, yeah. Okay, okay. I think it's very Leibnizian. Um, but um, uh, there, are, there are also differences, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, because he, uh, well, this, this has to do with the fact that, that it's a processual thing, it's a flow. The wholeness the, that is there in the world is, is, is not. Uh, static rigid structure, but is um, uh, a permanently moving flow. And um, he sees in the, the, the scientific advances of the 20th century, relativity theory and quantum theory, he sees in, in so that, that is a kind of development within science itself, but that leads to, for him, leads to a philosophical point that we have to affirm this wholeness that is there in the world, that is the world, and uh, this wholeness is a, is a, is a, has a processual nature. He sees that as a kind of consequence of the scientific developments, but a consequence that has much wider implications. Um, because it, it, it shows us that fragmentation, fragmentary thinking, um, leads to uh, a sense of alienation, leads to a sense of loss of connection with, with the world, and he blames a lot of the, the problems that society deals with today, blames it on this fragmentary mode of thinking. Um, but in the first chapter of Wholeness and the Implicate Order, um, he, uh, he, he says, well, can't we find in philosophy ways of thinking about this wholeness that is not fragmented? I mean, there are several examples in in, uh, in philosophy, if we look at Western philosophy as, for example, the whole, the whole very influential tradition of Neoplatonism, where you get um, the study of the one. We have to think about the sphere of being ultimately as the sphere of the one. 
and the one is uh, is not something that can be uh, named or expressed because if you give the name it's already two so it, it, it resists conceptualization and naming but nevertheless we can see that it must be there because without a sense of unity nothing can exist and this unity has got to come from somewhere so that's been a very influential idea in, 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 in all of theology and, and philosophy. So you might say there is a, there's a notion there of a kind of wholeness that, that is, pervades everything. Or you might go to uh, Eastern philosophy. He explicitly discusses that. And he says there you find, as we have seen already when we took Taoism, there you have the, the clear idea that there is um, an, an, uh, an, an inexpressible undifferentiated, non-differentiated reality, a oneness, that um, underlies everything. And uh, that fragmentation or individual existence is ultimately illusory. So he contrasts these two viewpoints and then says, yes, but they both uh, have over time probably, under the influence of the fact that these, these doctrines were written down and repeated by people and used as as molds for their thinking, they have become mechanical. They have become themselves fragmented. You can have a doctrine of the one, but if it's just repeated by people, then it becomes in itself ultimately a, a fragment. It becomes a, a concept. It becomes something that doesn't really connect people to this flow of, of reality itself. And so we always have to think again, or we have to think for ourselves, uh, to, to establish uh, an, an insight or an awareness of what this, what this wholeness means. And, um, and therefore, uh, although we can learn from philosophy of the past, we, cannot, uh, we have to learn from it. Uh, we cannot go there to find our answers. An essential element of this way of thinking is that we always have to find our answers for ourselves. Um, and I think that is where it becomes interesting because that's where something breaks in, in the very idea of what it means to think about fundamental questions that puts us directly in touch with something, with this, this flow of the world, as it were. It sounds maybe a bit mysterious or at the moment. Yeah. But, but the, yeah. Doesn't it sound exactly like what Nietzsche says about metaphor? That the, that I mean, that Concepts uh, after being used used for a while, they became purely worn out. Um, so it lost touch with reality. So that's the reason why he advocates using figurative language. And because people start to figurative language could recapture the yeah, people's sensuous, uh, particularity of the world. So isn't isn't that just the same argument? Or? And Nietzsche also has a processual way of looking at things. So I mean, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So what's new? In, Proposal. Yeah. I'm just wondering what's I don't know if Bohm ever read Nietzsche. <laughs> uh, uh, I think certainly what is new is that for, for Bohm there is a what is essential is the idea of wholeness. And then, so ultimately there is, a, there is an affirmation of the idea that, the, that reality is one. And that of course is not the case for Nietzsche. And there's also the, the idea that um, although yeah, Nietzsche sees it as a, as a, as a, as a power struggle. Yeah? Mm -hmm. so, uh, and that idea of power is, is very different here. Um, David Hall makes a comment about it in the text that we read about the, the difference between Nietzsche and, uh, and let's say, Taoism is, a relation, is, is the, the, the difference between power and creativity. And both would also probably say that creativity is the other of, of power. So this, but we can go, come back to that later. Let's first look. So so let's let's yeah let's just finish that. The idea is that the moment we start to so the the idea is that there is a relation between the whole and the fragment, that that is important here. The idea is that um, thinking about the whole we come to the conclusion that the whole is process, that it's a movement, it's a flow. Um, but the way to think about that cannot be via concepts because they stop the flow. <laughs> so how then do you think about them? Or what does it mean to think about, about, uh, about this wholeness? Um, 
there is one answer, one part of the answer is to say there can be different theoretical constructions of it, so science, but also other, other things. And the other one is to say we can somehow become part of that flow. And that is what creativity is. Um, so it's very interesting to see, I think that is maybe the why I wanted to discuss this text with you, is it's very interesting to see that once we start to think seriously about what creativity is, it changes how we think about what thinking is. It changes how we think about what, what philosophy is. It changes also, for example, what we think about what learning is. The, just as fragmentation is the, is the big problem in the sphere of con conceptual theory, ontology, metaphysics, in terms of learning, routine and mechanism, process, uh, uh, procedure of formality is the, is the death of, cre of creativity. And uh, I think Bohm is one of the people who, uh, in his own way, he writes in a very idiosyncratic language, in my view, um, has, has gone very far in taking that point really seriously. So I find him very interesting. Um, a lot of what he had to say, apparently in physics, also wasn't that much appreciated, although he, he, does have, he has, had a, has played a role, as far as I can tell. Um, but he, uh, he, he came to London, uh, left America, and uh, became a professor at Birkbeck. And then um, um, he also started to develop what is now known as Bohmian Dialogue. So this idea of the wholeness of the, of the implicate order is not something that applies just to physical reality in the sense of the, what, what physicists study. It applies also to our experiential world. And um, he believed that there, there is a kind of um, a possibility for, for groups of people to connect to this wholeness, to this implicate order, when they have a dialogue. And so he developed a format for dialogue which would enable people to talk about a topic in a dialogical way, there's a process for it, um, that would um, make the group as a whole smarter, as it were, than, <laughs> than, uh, than the individuals uh, uh, put together. So it was possible, according to, to Bohm, to, to have a real dialogue that is, that is a kind of group, it's kind of collective thinking that is more than what goes on in the head of, of each of us. Um, and this became uh, something that he practiced. He, 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 he ran these dialogue sessions. They're still going on. There's one. There's been one in uh, at Lancaster University on uh, environmental ethics, which has been going on for for ten years or so now. Um, so it's something that can have a long life. Um, uh, there's a, there's a certain th certain things you have to do, write write them up, record them, etc. We could look into that. But it, it has moved outside of, of physics to become, uh, yeah, a, a kind of a, a practice, a kind of a, a kind of a practice to to connect to this wholeness and to and to also from there discover a kind of creativity. Um, and he took a taxi to Hendon at one point and had a heart attack in the taxi, and that's when he died. So he <laughs> he died in Hendon, which. <laughs> So it's interesting because I, I work in Hendon as well at uh, Middlesex. Yeah. Um, um, and um, his work continued, so people continue to, to, to be engaged with these Bohmian dialogues. They're, they're still quite used quite a lot. And so I think it's maybe good to talk a little bit about this creativity, concept of creativity. Right. I find that quite interesting because he's saying you can get creativity by having these very formal dialogues, yeah. which seems to be a very mechanical procedure, which is, seems to be criticising in this paper. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know exactly how, how he runs this, or, or, or what, what the idea behind it is, but it's definitely not the idea that, that there isn't a kind of rule in the sense of you can only say this or only say that, or etc., etc. Uh, but um, there is a kind of structure that's created. People are put together in a room, uh, in a circle. Uh, there is a there, there are some some guide guides guidelines around listening to others, 
or when you how you should say something. But once that gets going, it, it creates a life of its own. Wouldn't you be allowed to sit in a circle? Because I think I might have experienced one of these. Quite oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> you found yourself in one. Yes. <laughs> was it maybe it was a Quaker meeting? No, no, it was about uh, the environment actually. Hmm. Well, I think it's become very popular in the world of business, and uh, and uh, and there must be must be all sorts of diluted forms of it. But um, a, a proper Bohemian dialogue is maybe yeah, they probably would have said that if you if you uh, if you were in it. But I mean, we can so maybe next time we can uh, we can I'll I'll send around some some texts that explain what what the idea behind the Bohemian dialogue is. Um, but as, as I think we experience it quite a, quite often when we talk in with people about a particular topic, that after a while uh, a, di- a dynamism starts to develop, in which uh, people can suddenly have ideas that they didn't couldn't have had outside of those discussions. Well, we, we had the rerun of this with the German romantics because they put the idea it's called dialogue. Actually, uh, Novalis you know, wrote article on dialogue. Yeah. But is where they had what they call philosophy, where ph- philosophizing together. Yeah. And they did it by meetings or writing to each other yeah. or exchanging text. Yeah. So the letters, the text themselves, the and form in a journal as well. Yeah. The the, the Athene, uh, Athenaeum. Oh, yeah, by yeah. Schlegels. And uh, produce so much work yeah. that we all know that we call it the German romantics. Yeah. In philosophy and literature and everything. Yeah. And uh, it's. I, I didn't actually read this one because I wrote it just today. But the other one on creativity is so much in connection with that period. Yeah. Because in Goethe, you find the earth phenomena, ph- phenomena is to look for the whole yeah. rather than looks for the individual uh, item. Exactly. And yeah. he thought that actually what you're looking for are these fragments. Once you figured out the, the the whole, you can reproduce them like the uh, this chemical table, and the periodical table. So it's it's by by latching on to the earth phenomena, original phenomena, you can actually uh, produce the fragments. That's right. I mean, there's also there the link to the notion of Gestalt. Yeah. So the the, the 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 whole form, as it were, that comes up there. And this dialogue, it's interesting to, to hear that about the romantic, the, the sun philosophizing, yeah. is very different from the platonic dialogues, it's a, which are very, they're called dialogues, but they have a very monological uh, <laughs> ring to them, eh, if, you, uh, if you read them. There's also a wonderful text by um, uh, uh, Humboldt on, um, called Über den Dualis, on the, on the, the dual, the dual uh, multiple form in language, words like both, yeah? So languages have words that indicate uh, a pair, but, but many languages don't have words that, implica- that, that, that uh, indicate uh, a group of three or four or five. Uh, there are even languages that have separate, s- separate verb forms for uh, when, you are, when you're with two. <laughs> Yes, yeah, Slovenian. Ah. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, very, it's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you use it so often. <laughs> like yeah, the, that you don't realize. But yeah, uh, yeah, but it's all like all the verbal constructions and adjectives and everything is then adjusted. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's and uh, so so uh, Humboldt is, uh, wrote, wrote this article Über den Dualis in which he also Über den Dualis. Über den Dualis. Oh. D U A L I S. Um, in which he then also talks about dialogue, and he says, so we only really get an idea when we, when we hear it back from someone else. And uh, that's an experience that I think many people have, you know, when, you, when you're talking to somebody and they say something that, that you thought yourself, then you think, yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> but then suddenly it appears in a, in a, in a, in a clearer light. Uh, so... Uh, but that, that, is, uh, that is also the ebooks point, and Taylor uh, commented on it uh, in, um, in uh, uh, what, what is that book? Versions of the Self, uh, <coughs> Charles Taylor. Yeah. He raised this exactly the same point. 
Taylor. Yeah, Charles Taylor. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Take about Hegel. Me. Yeah. And he said that even when we are, when we think that we are, um, when, even when we think that we are thinking alone by ourselves, actually we are carrying out a dialogue with ourselves. Yeah, yeah, dialogue, of course. So yes. That is a Hegelian point. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I don't know if that matters a lot, but. Mm-hmm. Uh, Certainly, yes. It, of course, it, it's the, it's the, the, the dialect of recognition. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Uh, but in Hegel, it becomes absolute spirit talking to itself. It's no longer real, real people talking with each other, um, I think. And that's, that is, of course, what we're dealing with here. And that's maybe also what Humboldt had in mind. More than, uh, but of course, these, 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 these ideas are everywhere. Okay, let's... Um, Yeah, let's let's go to the to the text. So, what is what, what is creativity then? Or can can I can can somebody uh, point out something where we might find a starting point for a discussion? He says that it comes from not from preconceived ideas, but from something completely new. Yeah. So there's no pattern before it or preconceived ideas. So you got to bring it's, it's much like poetic vision or something of the whole. It is it is something that has no precursor. No. Yeah. It's also something that cannot be defined in words. Mm-hmm. So he starts by pointing out that even talking about it is uh, is something uh, that's uh, that's not not like maybe some other forms of speech. Creativity might be something that is impossible to define in words, he says. How then can we talk about it? Words can indicate or point to something in the minds of the readers that may be similar to what is in the mind of the writer. I would like thus to indicate to the reader what creativity means to me. If you will read in this spirit, you can then see whether and to what extent my notions make sense to you. I think that's already really refreshing (laughs) to hear somebody say something like that. Mm -hmm. That um, there are things that we can't really say directly, but we can still talk about them indicatively, and then you can see whether you uh, can relate to it or not. Maybe, that, maybe that's related to the point about Nietzsche earlier, about concepts. Because these concepts are used before, so they got their own connotation. The, 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 reference of it, the reference of it is fixed. Any concept you take, the, the, there's this reference to it that's fixed, so pre-given, while he's saying that we could sh- to show something new. So you've got to take it from the reference that it's usually have to something completely new. So you could you couldn't really do it with conceptually, that's why people say you can't use the same concept that we use in this world about things in the other world, for example, for yeah. people who believe in other worlds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because all the references to this world. Uh, so I think that's the problem, and that's where you are pushed to uh, either create new, like mathematics and physics, in your notations, or uh, go into a poetic vision. That's right. So he, he then starts by, by um, examining the case of the scientist. So he links his question of creativity to scientific procedure. I, I expect that it is very different, the creativity for a scientist than for an artist. I mean, it, 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 uh, the scientist creates something for, um, for some kind of use, a certain... 
a trip lead to something which can be used or in, or in, in um, a new... I'm sorry, I, I didn't come on to read this. I no, no, but it's a very point. good point yeah. that you start with that because he, he, he says no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That, that's what you would think, mm. but if you then ask the question, why are scientists so interested in their work, then it can't be that it's something useful, mm. or it can't be that they find out a way to predict natural phenomena, which we usually say it is the goal of yeah. science is to predict. Yeah? No, it's something else. It's an eagerness to find something, to, to find wholeness, beauty, harmony in, in nature's process. And that um, a certain purpose or solution or, or product, a useful product, might just be a byproduct of the process yeah. to finding this harmonious totality, wholeness exactly. um, in nature's process. Yeah. So that's, that, that's quite a claim to make. That's also, let's say, at odds with the HR strategy of universities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, I think there's a, that's a, already itself a big, a big thing. Um, and then he seems to imply, if I read correctly, that, that this is also always something that has to do with originality. Yeah. That you can, you can, as it were, only discover this wholeness every time again anew for yourself. Something like that. He seems to he seems to imply that that this has to do with creativity. Because he says even if it's if you assume that it's they don't want to do it for the for the for the for the, for the usefulness or to predict uh, does he want to? Does the scientist want to get a kick out of meeting the challenge of explaining? No, because you know, uh, after a while, we could, we would get fed up with that. Um, indeed, if a scientist worked mainly in order to get hold of such pleasures and continue them as long as possible, his activity would not only be rather meaningless and trivial, but also contrary to what is needed for carrying out his research effectively. So, indeed, it is about something else. One aspect of what this something might be can be indicated by noting that the search is ultimately aimed at the discovery of something new that had previously been unknown. But of course, it is not merely the novel experience of working on something different and out of the ordinary. Rather, what he is really seeking is to learn something new that has a certain fundamental kind of significance, i.e. it has a total unknown lawfulness in the order of nature which exhibits unity in a broad range of phenomena. Thus he wishes to find in the reality in which he lives a certain oneness and totality or wholeness constituting a kind of harmony that's not beautiful. And that's the what you just read said, yeah? Okay, so what do, what do, what do we think of that? I think it's interesting really, because he mentions both discovery and creativity together. And uh, although scientists talk about discovering things, uh, that can be a little bit misleading, I think. Because um, you wouldn't normally say that discovering something is creative. I mean, the fact that, say, Columbus discovered America, you wouldn't say that was a creative act as such. So I think the, the point is that when scientists say they discover something, like they, they come forward with a new theory, um, they are actually creating a theory. It's not discovering something about the world, it's actually creating something. And um, I found something in Karl Popper about this. It says, we invent our myths and our theories, and we try them out, and we see how far they will take us. So it's not actually... Because he, Popper said that as an argument against induction, because the logical positivists had said, you know, use the process of induction to discover things. And Popper says, no, you, you make a speculative conjecture and then see if it works out. Yeah, and that's why the scientists also get a kick out of doing some experiments to see if it can be applied because it can it shows that their speculations were at least in the right direction that's right yeah yeah. but uh, exactly yeah and that's what he says as well isn't it I mean that's why they are interested in it not, not for any that's where, that's where the primary interest goes but 
But isn't that kind of experimentation part of the creative process? Because it's it's basically it's it's playing. Experimenting is playing, and then certain things work out one way or fail or work out in a different way, and then that is discovery. Then you discover it works, it doesn't work, or yeah. Yeah, I think he's talking about this corpo thing. Uh, I've done physics in, in my youth, uh, and I did research. And you can do, you can play with experiments. But it's all I did on aluminium. It's all the experiments it's about aluminium, uh, aluminium specimen. So I, I play with it whichever way I like. But it's still about this particular aluminium. But I think Bohm is talking something quite uh, extraordinary, and I think it goes deeper than just uh, what the scientists do is a state of mind that he goes to the root of it, yeah. which is state of mind. When Einstein didn't come and say, oh, uh, uh, Newton is wrong and I'll give you a better theory, he completely gave a different conception. So it's, it's, it's more than a different. I don't know whether, uh, Johan, I could relate it to that uh, uh, theoretical frames, which we did, uh, White's. Yeah, yeah White's uh, theoretical yeah, it's, frame. It's works. coming up with a different theoretical frame. So there is a theoretical frame that was yeah. Newtonian, and someone gets out of that frame completely. Yeah. That's actually more more to think the whole yeah. than think of the whole as the whole universe. Yeah. Because we never get anywhere uh, to think for every particular problem you you face to contrast to think, but to think the totality of your uh, theoretical frame, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So a new theoretical frame gives you a new insight, totality, as it were, yeah. in which to have insights. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, but this notion of experimentation is very important. Huh? It's it's it's. A theoretical framework is not something that just comes out of the blue. It's uh, it's it's a it's a product of experience and and, and reflection. Um, yes, but uh, scientists don't do it, uh, experiments just at random. They always do it for a particular purpose, an idea first. Yeah. So the yeah, you can't just start experiments. Yeah, the idea precedes the yeah. experiment. Yeah. And it's only then when. Um, you run into problems and you can't explain things that people start then to look for new theories and new explanations. Yeah. So you get long periods where people are quite clear to test out the theoretical framework, see how far it will go. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And that's in philosophy in a way the same. Yeah. In philosophy we also have, as Alan White would say, we also have theoretical frameworks and when they no longer work then they will do something else. So um, but, I mean, there is a relation between this kind of process of discovery or creation, also of art, of course, that is, it's not just an element of creation, it's also an element of discovery. An artist also tries out things to see what works and what doesn't. Yeah? So I think there's also there an element of not just of, of pure creation, but there's also a, a, a discovery element. But nevertheless, both of these are concerned with, yeah, so in whatever way we think about it, this experience of oneness, totality, wholeness, constituting a kind of harmony that is itself felt to be beautiful. Even if it is the, uh, I think that word harmony might be a little bit misleading, because um, it, could, it could well involve, uh, let's say if you, if you think about a musician, uh, the jazz example, it could well involve uh, dissonance. It doesn't, uh, that, that harmony includes, of course, if it's to total, then it includes the dissonance in a certain way as well. Um, so I think, at least, uh, yeah, I, I think it would have to be, it includes, the, the unity includes the difference. Um, and that's, uh, in, incidentally, a very important point that he gets back to in the, in the wholeness and the implicate order, that um, it, the, this, this sin of fragmentation, of taking an abstraction to be the, the concrete reality, is uh, thinking in the wrong way about wholeness and difference, or unity and difference, or identity and difference. It's not, it's, not, it's not the difference itself that is the problem, but it is the, for him, it is the, the, the reification 
of fragments into ind independent realities that, uh, that then have to be have to, you have to find a way to, to stick it together again. That is the problem. So th that's important to see. I think that it's not about denying difference because, in a way, the new is is the different is, is always the different. <laughs> The new newness is different to otherness. Yeah. So he must have started from a sort of metaphysical theory that the world in itself is harmonious. But that's that's what I'm trying to say. That, and, that and there is a sort of a mind in it. Yeah. Which he is, when I had to interview with him at the end of this book, yeah. he, he talks about there is like mind or intelligence somewhere. And we'll look to latch on to that sort of intelligence. Yes, yes, yes. He seems to have this idea that there's cosmic. Intelligence yeah. that is real, yeah, like a we, universal we mind. Maybe, maybe, maybe the intelligence at time one is different than different as a state from intelligence at yeah. time two, uh, and so on. And yeah. so, it's not like the world. All that is, as uh, Wittgenstein would have it, and that we picture in it. But you picture it at each moment. So the. The world renews itself. Yeah. This reality renews itself, but always in a harmonious and interconnected thing. Yeah. And, and then you've got to move your mind or uh, your own intelligence in harmony with that. Yeah, that's right. He seems to be saying that that yes, there is a uh, what is disharmonious is ultimately not real. Not real. Yeah. 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 Do you think that's or get us in conflict? But what he we say he says that the the mind gets to the extreme limit it gets into neurosis. Yeah, that's because it, exactly. So fragmentation yeah. in the at the level of the mind ultimately becomes so at the level of which is manageable is just social alienation. Becomes but, mechanical. Right? But, but it's mechanical, but it becomes psychosis, neurosis. Uh, and a, and, and a schizoid uh, state of mind, yeah. So he, that's his view, that uh, illness... Wholeness is, is health, yeah, he also says that. He links it, of course, to these etymologies that we have about healing and, and the whole, uh, etc. Um, but whether he, uh, so as with Bloch, you know, always sees the, the, the whole, H-O-L-E, in the whole, in the W... H O L E. Uh, I I think he, he does. I think, don't think that's his issue. His issue is not that there is no negation or that there is no in, no no interruption or anything like that. But it's just the, the status that we assign to it. And I think that's maybe an interest. Yeah, maybe that's an interesting point. That that he seems to be saying. Yeah, we're forgetting about something if we make that if we make those interruptions into. Into uh, somehow at the same level as this unity. So you could say it's a very classical metaphysical idea that somehow the one is more basic than the many because the many couldn't even be many if they weren't also in some sense one. That seems to be a very, very uh, so already a Platonic idea, and he seems to want to re re reinvigorate that in a sense. It seems to me that what he's saying is between the mechanical. There are two different or two levels to reality. One is the mechanical one, which enables us to get on in life from day to day to the routine jobs. And there is a level which goes higher than that. So you get the causal order, which is mechanical. Yeah. And then you, you, you get this creative order, which is when you go above the causal chain and look at the whole. Yes, that's right, but, but okay, yeah, yeah. But you need that, that higher order is maybe, it's not higher, but it's, it's first. Yeah, you, need it. you need it for the mechanical it depends one. Which way you look at it. I think for a creative, creative person or mind, you, you, you will conceive the whole picture before going into the details of it. Well, let's, okay, let's investigate that a bit deeper by looking at what he says about how children learn. Uh, Can you a picture of that? Page one, 138. 
concept of originality and creativity yeah. in during childhood, growing up at school, and then later at work, so that um, as a young child you explore and you start and you start learning how to walk, and um, that's a creative process. Yeah. Um, whereas, like, when you get older and you're at school, um, you th that phase of learning is more about accumulating knowledge and in the next kind of phase of your of, of one's life when you're at work that phase of learning has more utilitarian purpose when you're at work you it's it's a very kind of like yeah mechanical process that you're at work to make a living um to earn money and at work you produce things or you Whatever you do has a very specific um, mechanical purpose most of the time. Yeah. And so that the ability to see something new and original, original actually gradually dies as one becomes older. Yeah. Um, we yeah. become routine, routinized ourselves, yeah. we become mechanical, yeah. our so features. No. Our, even our features become rigid and... I wonder if one can say um, that one learns how to walk. I think it happens because the muscles are, uh, are strong and the child is um, aping the adult, wants to do the same as the adult, so it's not really a learning. Also, I don't see yeah. it as a learning yeah. process. I, I see, as the natural development. And my mother always taught me, my grandfather has taught me how to walk. And I think this is uh, nonsense. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's right, that's a nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> if they don't teach you, then you, then you can't walk. Yeah, no. Just by chance that in the moment when he looked, <laughs> yeah. I started walking. Yeah, but that's, that's, yeah. A, that's but not what he says. Yeah. Yeah. But perhaps it's. I mean, that is just one example. You could perhaps even go back um, to when, like, a baby just starts following, like, with its eye movement, following movements that happen around him, or starts um, gripping with the fingers. I mean, it's a good question. Is that how much um, uh, impulse does the baby need from the outside world in order to have that natural development? But yeah. I think what is interesting is that he brings that example of this Helen Keller. Yeah. yeah. Um, he is uh, born, no, born but blind and deaf. Well, not, not born, but at a very, very early age. Um, uh, she couldn't um, see and hear. Yet through a teacher, she could develop a concept of concepts of of the world and understanding of her surroundings, um, and that was again a creative process. But it's an interesting thought to question what is natural, what is natural development, and what is yeah, what and is a creative process. Um, I think what is neat a lot of stimulation, not only the child, it's then yeah, what's going yeah, yeah. on. And I also think when the child has too much stimulation, mm -hmm. that it shuts off. I mean, I don't know, but yeah, it's yeah. just an, um, what just came to yeah, my mind, yeah, yeah, yeah. because I do that. When there's yeah. too much going on, I can't cope anymore, and I say no. Yeah, it's <laughs> information. Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. Um, but he seems to be talking about uh, so so the, of course there's the question what comes from the outside what comes from the child itself um, and maybe uh, yeah that's we don't know uh, you know when he wrote this article 1968 was the height of Chomsky uh, in, in, uh, in, in language studies was basically the idea that uh, that you were born with a, an innate grammar and it just required a, 
a little a little input from the for the child is basically we had to find out which of the languages that was programmed in, inside was the one that was spoken in the <laughs> environment and then it was well it's a caricature uh, so a very high level of, of pre-formed yeah, I, I think I mean, but today linguists are much more uh, have, have sort of retreated from that and think there's much more actual construction of grammatical rules going on in mind by simply imitating and, and uh, and gathering, the, the, the child is now seen as a little statistical machine who generates uh, patterns on the basis of, of, of observation. But I think if you if maybe if you go to the experience of, of how children are, then there is a kind of maybe what he's trying to say is a kind of self-motivating uh, desire to learn. Or to, yeah, if you let a child do its own thing, then it will start to learn. And it will start to learn in a creative way by looking for looking for things that interest or are, are, are important and, and yeah, I think what you want to say? Yeah. Well, um, it's just from my own experience that <laughs> that everything is there and it just um, when I was a child I couldn't read my father, who had uh, no idea of how to deal with children, said to me, Do read this now! And I could read. I suddenly could read. I'd never had a problem with reading in, the, in this, um, when we were very young in school, and we had um, homework, um, practice in reading. I never did this. I could always read. The same happened to my brother. He again said, Do read this now! <laughs> I, I, I still find this so puzzling. <laughs> what, was it because uh, were you scared into, uh, yes, into learning? Well, yeah. Or, yeah. Well, I hated my father. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe because of that. I don't yeah. know. I really don't know how this is possible to happen. Well, I think it's, it's very fascinating because, I mean, it's clear that the exposure to language that children ex do experience is not sufficient for them to gain their full skills in language. Yeah. Because they never hear enough variety in language. That's clear, yeah. But that, that's very clear. But if you ask a Chomskyan, uh, what is this universal ground? They, they can't tell you. Mm. No. Even though people have been trying to yeah, discover it and find out exactly what it is, they'll say, well, I'll have the and that's about as far as they can get. And it, become, and it has become, over the course of linguistic Chomsky theory, it's become more and more minimalist. So it's become more bare uh, I, I as know. it I went think, on. Yeah. I think children speak like what they hear on, from their parents or from other people who are around them a lot. Well, okay, so. I mean, but, but maybe we can detach the, the, what we're talking about here from, from this kind of detail, for what to put it like that, around input and, uh, and, and what comes from the, from the child itself. But, you know, just, so the way he describes it, yeah, I think uh, it is, it is, uh, it's very uh, telling. The ability to learn in this, so rather he must be able to learn something new even if this means that ideas and notions that are comfortable or dear to him may be overturned. But the ability to learn in this way is a principle common to the whole of humanity. Thus it is well known that a child learns to walk, to talk, and to know his way around the world just by trying out something and seeing what happens. I think that's, that's still true. Yeah? Even if you are, let's say, radical Chomsky and, and, and you believe in a very highly specified internal grammar, then the child still has to try. Still has to try. So, well, what is the, you know, is is there a, a dual form in, in the in the verbal structure of my language, or the language that these people around me speak, or not? Yeah. So he still has to, still has to experiment. Just for trying out something, seeing what happens, then modifying what he does or thinks in accordance with what has actually happened. In this way, he spends his first few years in a wonderfully creative way, discovering all sorts of things that are new to him. And this leads people to look back on childhood as a kind of lost paradise. 
Yeah? So it's the high mad that we talked about. Yeah? Uh, as the child grows older, however, learning takes on a narrow meaning. Yeah, we, we saw that. Yeah? And then uh, that goes on uh, even into, into adulthood. So this, this blissful state of, the, of the, the, the child who is sort of learning completely in a self-motivated way, that's what he's talking about. And that's where he lo lo localizes this originality. Mm. That's where it sits. Yes, yeah, because in school you're penalized much more quickly for the mistakes. So the scope of trying is kind of minimalized, right? And this is the scope which you need for revenge to for the originality to eventually appear. Yeah, you, you, so, so what is originality? Is the, is the capacity to learn something new? Mm. Is it the capacity to learn something new or the capacity to have new concepts? Yeah. Because I think you need, the child needs conceptual framework within which they can learn. And once they have the conceptual framework, and they can learn all their school learning without any problems. And as long as they never encounter any problems, they have no need to develop new concepts. But I think this is um, why it says you can't really describe what creativity is, because mm. you, if it's the development of a new concept, it has to be something, well, which cannot be described with the existing concepts. Yeah, so otherwise it wouldn't be new. Yeah. yeah, that's right, that's right. Uh, w what is this quali quality of originality? It is very hard to define or specify. Indeed, to define originality would in itself be a contradiction <coughs> since whatever action can be defined in this way must evidently henceforth be unoriginal. Perhaps then it would be best to indicate, hint at it obliquely. But I think that is, that is sort of the hard point that he's trying to make. That, that there is this thing. If you want to understand, so his example is, let's try to understand why scientists get so enthusiastic about their work and, and then he says it's not utility, it's not the kick of insight, it's not prediction no it is this establishing of an, an insight that it's new a new insight into discovering something new, that, so it is originality and originality cannot be defined so now we're at the, at the core of spontaneity as something new that happens and then he's, he's, he says, well, that's not something that scientists do, or orig original geniuses. No, we do it all, all it's, it's common, or as he says, a principle common to the whole of humanity. Only uh, that most people stop doing it once they, <laughs> once they have been schooled. Yeah. But uh, this is an easy said and actually uh, because uh, we do seem to be thinking differently. <coughs> we are not all artists, for example, and not all artists see things in the same way. So there are, there are these, uh, I know it's a egalitarian thing, but, but in reality we are maybe wired differently in a certain sense. I go on a room and uh, to visit a friend and I come home and I talk to my wife, or I, it's a conversation and so on that I have with my friend. My wife comes home and she tells me how the, the furniture was and how things were in the room and so on. What attracts her is different than the, what attracts me. Or we go to dinner and she, I talk about something when I come home. Different. She, she noticed quite different things. Uh, yeah. Or I, I have no problem with my books, but she got a different idea of how to read the books. And but I think that's not something that he denies in this article. Yeah. What I'm saying is creativity. Yeah. It's, it seems in practice less available to people than, yeah. than he yeah. suggests this commonly. But, but I could agree with him on one ground that, as uh, Johan just said, is maybe the way we brought up or dealt with reality 
no one to our creative yeah. ability. Yeah. And he's trying to generate it again. Yeah. But I think this is what he says as well about society, that society um, suppresses eventually the individual to conform to certain norms of, of um, morals, so, yeah. social morals, behavior, um, yeah, conformities um, that, uh, which means that an individual is, for example, afraid of making mistakes by experimenting or playing because he wants to conform with society. He doesn't want to embarrass himself or herself. It's like when you develop a yeah. um, self or ego um, that's uh, shaped by the society or community you grew up in, which means the society tries to make a, a perfect individual out of yeah. the children they are, they are raising. Um, which, depending on, on their education, children are either encouraged to explore more or perhaps um, try to be as conformist as possible. And I would agree with him if uh, you're educated in a way to be as conformist as possible, um, you probably tend to uh, follow a more mechanical way of living, as he describes it. Yeah. And uh, have greater barriers of um, exploring, experimenting, and eventually being creative, creating original ideas or concepts. Yeah. Because you're constantly afraid of doing something wrong, perhaps not being non conform He seems to be saying that fear is the big, the, the, the big counterpart to yeah. creativity. Yeah. Yeah? yeah, that's right. And, and so there's also like an evolutionary survival element there. but. Is we have what we have to be aware of and and, and try to counter. Yeah, that's a, I think that's that's a, that's a, that's what he says. Now, um, but I mean, it's not so. He also says that this originality is actually uh, so. Fear has a, has maybe a function, and it can can become too much, and then we become conformist. But this creativity is also important because he goes on to say, I thought that was very, uh, he goes on to introduce the notion of perception. Um, and then, so, and ultimately I think this leads to the idea that the, this original newness of the scientist, but also of the artist, is percept, has the quality of perception. And that's also where we, where we can understand maybe a little bit more why we can't uh, uh, talk about it discursively. It's the same as trying to talk discursively about the perception. There is a kind of directness to it, an intuitive element. So he says, uh, it is impossible to overemphasize the significance of this kind of learning, the, the kind of learning that a child does, in every phase of life, and the importance of giving the action of learning itself top priority ahead of the specific content of what is to be learned. For the action, why? For the action of learning is the so on the 138 at the bottom. For the action of learning is the essence of real perception. In the sense that without it, a person is unable to see in any new situation what is a fact and what is not. That's so true. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, explain. For example, I don't know, I can relate in my experience mostly to sports yeah. like how um, when I learn a new sport how much then when I watch the others I can just see new things where before I was not even aware were happening yeah yeah yeah, yeah. exactly and, yeah. but it's only because I went through the action of someone showing me and with me then doing it and seeing how it was different to what I was doing before that then yeah. It also emerged like. Yeah. Is this um, so? How how does how do you think this relates to uh, to to the Platonic idea of learning as anamnesis, as remembering? 
So we, we, we know in philosophy, the classical view of, of knowledge is, or of learning is that it's a remembering. Yes. We talked about it today. Uh, uh, an, an anamnesis, yeah? And, and it's a very, very simple, quite compelling argument that Plato has. It's got to come from somewhere. So it's, the best thing to do is to say it's already there. Uh, how does this relate to, uh, to, to this, this very important idea that learning is anamnesis? Well, there is, no, there is no such thing as new and creativity, right? No. It goes back to what you were saying, that this concept only really emerged very recently. Because there is just more of a sense of uh, digging or discovering, finding out. Yeah. and then reproducing it. It's, um, yeah, and, and so maybe this, this, this innocent-looking little sentence uh, hides um, a, a, a big departure from mm -hmm. philosophically established notions of learning. Which, which sentence are you using? Uh, page 138, second yes. column. Hmm? Page 138, the second, second column. Yes. A bit lower. Which, which sentence? Uh, there, in the last... Uh, the last paragraph? For the action of learning is the essence of real perception. Oh, in the sense that without it, the person is unable to see in any new situation what is a fact and what is not. Okay. Of course, there is a routine, a mechanical kind of perception that we carry out habitually in dealing with what is familiar. That's where Plato starts by saying, when we, even when we see something we don't understand, we, we have a kind of, uh, there's kind of triggering of a memory or something like that. That it is familiar. That is the whole point of Plato is to say, learning is to put in touch with what is already familiar. This is generally what we tend to do. For example, few people have a not more than a small number of habitually determined salient features of their friends, of the places in which they live, etc. <laughs> I think that's true. The Burkhard Schmidt, the Bloch student, who yeah, mm -hmm. we talked about, said that once said, uh, and that was for me very eye opening, he said, Yeah, um, don't you agree that the, the place where you grew up as a child, so the daily surroundings where you lived as a child, that's the, the, the physical space that you, that you get to know. The best of any place that you uh, have ever that you will ever be, you never get that again. The way a child knows every nook and cranny and every you know everything in the. If, if I think about myself, that's absolutely true. I knew I knew everything of the the house and the area around it, and in no way that uh, that I've ever had before uh, afterwards. Yeah, I think that uh, so so. That's, that's true, there's a kind of sense of truth to that. Yeah? But real perception that is, but, so that's the one, the familiar one. But real perception that is capable, real perception is capable of seeing something new and unfamiliar. Requires that one be attentive, alert, aware, and sensitive. In this frame of mind, one does something. And then one notes the difference between what actually happens and what is inferred from previous knowledge. That's the experimental attitude. <laughs> from this difference, one is led to a new perception or a new idea that accounts for the difference. And this process can go on indefinitely without end. Of let's say small and important details 
which I have the impression that really when he was talking about the child learning, it was something which was you know, qualitatively or conceptually new. Yeah. And here you, here you think not. Well, I'm not sure here. Yeah, when it gets down to it's, this, uh, in this case, it is not that quality and quantity is one. Um, well, I was thinking about when the child is learning about their environment. I think that is, that is quantitatively new. They learn lots of new facts about the things about them. But it's not qualitatively new, it's just more detail. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't understand the difference here in this case between quantity and quality. Well, qualitatively new would be some kind of new concept. Um, for example, that I th dogs bite or something yeah. like that. <laughs> the child might learn. Yeah. But uh, when they're going around and, and learning how the layout of all the streets are around the house, that is. It's not, that's not qualitatively new. They, they know what the street is, they know what an orientation is, and they just discover a new one. That's more of a discovery than a... Maybe that's more, yeah, but maybe that... But of course, there you can also, uh, on that journey of discovery, the child can discover qualitatively new things as well. Yes, as well, yes. yes. Finding out certain things work and certain things don't work and, yeah. Peirce also describes this kind of learning when he, when he talks about the child learning that the stove is hot. Mm -hmm. So the, the first, the, before the child has burned its, uh, his hands on the stove, the, the parents say, the stove is hot. And Peirce says, and the child says, no, it's not. <laughs> it isn't. <laughs> then he touches it. <laughs> then it becomes hot. <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, yeah. You talk somewhere about the noticing the similarities and differences in one set and then have a conception of if you, if you see so something different, then you notice the similarities in, in this different thing and then you build up on, on that in a creative way. Yeah. He, he talks about, for example, we see things as, as they are. Not in the similarity of things. This situation is like this room setting up roads and so on. It's similar there, and even in science, you could go on using some theory until you you notice something that doesn't fit. Yeah. Uh, I remember my supervisor. He noticed something which came on to his name. He was studying some Italian scientist. Bordoni, and then he found something else, a peak in the graph, and it's called after him. And he told me, you know, so that so there's something called internal friction or metal, and you get these two peaks in the graph uh, against temperature, internal friction against temperature. And he said, uh, at the end, there are some things that come up, come up, and then in some experiments, and they don't come up again. And they quite occasionally, they come up. And I asked him once, what are these? He ah, he said, these are Hazigoti peaks. As a, as a Japanese scientist who found them. He said, I actually first noticed them before he did. He said, I couldn't work it out. Whether they come sometimes or they don't come some other times. The other guy sat and said, well, what's so different about these? Why these two peaks are stable? Yeah. You can't reproduce them all the time. And this one, just sort of, they look like random, but he sat down and worked out the, the physics for them and become known after him. Yeah. And, and people know them as a phenomenon, it's not right. So it, it needed different uh, conception of what the problem is. On the old conception of just explaining these two. Exactly, yeah. They became an ex just a, an anomaly or... Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it requires a... Exactly, yeah. Someone forgets about this and think about the new phenomenon. Yeah. Exactly. See what's really about it. Yeah. The similarities and the difference. That's a very that's a very good example. Yeah. So. Okay, but this kind of this kind of creativity learning is everywhere. He has now argued. Um, and now page one thirty nine at the bottom. 
Having seen a creativity of some kind may be possible in almost any conceivable field, and that it's always founded on the sensitive perception, sensitive perception of what is new. That was the Japanese scientist. Now he had the attentiveness, alertness, awareness to look, go into it and try to account for it. Yeah? Exactly as he says. Um, so the sensitive perception of what is new and different from what is inferred from previous knowledge. We shall now go on to inquire in more detail into what it actually is. In other words, what does a person do when he is being original and creative? that distinguishes him from one who is only mediocre. <laughs> there is a difference between being original and being, being mediocre. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then he asks, uh, what is the, the result? The, that's the one first thing to look at. We must distinguish between an occasional act of penetrating insight and the discovery of something new that is really creative. In the latter, I suggest there is the perception of a new basic order that is potentially significant in a broad and rich field. This new order leads eventually to the creation of new structures, having the quality of harmony and totality, and therefore the feeling of beauty. Yeah, and there he starts to talk about uh, difference and similarity. You know? And he talked, and yeah, exactly. And now, and, and, and now he seems to be saying that um, it's about seeing similar and different similarities and differences. <laughs> yeah. It is just because people find that they cannot communicate their often genuine perceptions regarding the quality of order that they are inclined to assume that these perceptions are purely private and subjective. How is this, how is this relation between difference and similarity? How is it structured? things and things that fall into a particular category you say are the same but yet you know there are differences within that category so you could say that um, in the category of mammals there are horses and sheep and all the rest of it um, they're all mammals but they're all different as well so yeah. you've got both similarity and different because you have a, a hierarchy of Uh, so can you can you uh, buy a hierarchy? Well, I think when you look at the world, I mean, Aristotle had his ten categories, and Kant had twelve, and these are what you need to see 
individual things in the environment around you. Otherwise, everything would just be a confusing blur of sound <coughs> and, and colours and whatever. Um, so you need something to start with, but those Aristotelian or Kantian categories are so basic you can't do very much with them. You have to then, on the basis of that, and I presume this is what children do, they start developing more sophisticated categories, which then form a hierarchy which can go into any level of detail that is, is necessary. Yeah. So uh, I think that's where the, you know, the categories come from. And um, presumably the ones, you, you know, you need some basic ones in order to sort of bootstrap the whole process. You've got to get started somehow. Yeah. So there may be some objective basic categories, but all the rest are relative to culture, experience, and so on. They can be modified. And, and that's why the possibility for creativity comes in. Because then you could, as the occasion requires, you can invent a new concept category and see things, see the world in a completely different way if you're clever enough to invent a basic category, not one of the fine detail ones, which yeah. is perhaps just a small insight. But you, if you can look, say, like Einstein and see there's something really fundamentally different right at the, the trunk of the tree of yeah, yeah, this, yeah. Uh, this hierarchy, then you've just got something really creative. Yeah, exactly, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I think it becomes very obvious what you say about um, different communities or cultures obviously have their own sense of categorizing, clustering, etc. And when you travel with your with your concept of categorizing and clustering into a different culture, let's say if you're European and you travel over to Asia and you all of a sudden experience that clash of um, or things work differently over there. This is then how you can you realize different cultures see the world in a different way. And I, and I can see that actually even that clash of um, perhaps categorization can lead to very interesting moments of um, creativity because it um, in, it almost forces the individual to think differently or reflect on their own um, categorization systems. So. Yeah. When I read it, I, I similarities and differences and so on. Uh, also then came in my mind Hegel and things, but that's too abstract, I think. But you find that idea that everything would but identity and difference. So they there's the identity of identity and difference. So there's always this shift in the identity between the identity of identity and identity of identity and difference. Yeah. So there's always shift towards a stable, relatively stable situation where you get identity and then soon move out, move out of it. And then you find into a difference that's searching for sort of identity. And Perhaps that's the source of the creativity in, in, uh, in nature and then in reality and then reflects in our mind as well. So yeah. creative, creativity is um, giving new identities to you. No, because, because say, for example, you go through this capital system and people assume this is a permanent fact of life, that people always like that. Like, you have to have money in their pocket, their own private houses and so on, they can't really conceive. Before the USSR came along, nobody actually conceived that. You can have things differently. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but just say an example. Right. And, uh, and then uh, people realize there is a change, and then people get threatened by that change, by the difference. So they reestablish the identity by get going back to what they, they know. But if you leave it to run its own course, maybe it will create a negation and then the, that negation to come to a certain form will be negated later on. Uh, that's why if you go on the classical Marxism, Marx couldn't really envisage what is the future. Because how it is, no one knows. Things will, will be uh, moving 
all the time between this identity and out of identity and to another identity. I was thinking of that when I read it, but I didn't think he was doing that way. He is trying to bring it down to every day's level. Mm. But uh, I'm saying in a metaphysical sense, you can think that the reality is so. And then some of the thought uh, also brought to my mind something else, which is that wholeness and the mechanical is in chain. There is a distinction between world and nature. For him, world is, is the totality of, of the products of nature. Nature has products. And, and, and nature is the creative force yeah. uh, and the totality behind all these uh, individual items. The uh, Thura, Yeah, yeah which, which goes back to, uh, in some way, to Spinoza. I used to think that Spinoza was this term, but he, he didn't. The natural, 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 yeah, natural, yeah, natural, but apparently he did some other expression he used. But it's all the same idea that there is a creative side, and there is, which is like a spirit or whatever, yeah. and a creative, and there is the mechanical, which is the end of the product of that creativity, yeah. and to another set of the creativity. Yeah, the products are, the, are, are in, in his terms, are the fragments. The fragments, yeah. the mechanical. Yeah. 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 So this, that's right. Can we then say that creativity is is uh, uh, to do similar things differently, or different things similarly, or is that not the? Uh... Well, you've got to find an order that is identical, or has an identity, or it's stable, or the uh, fall into routine, whatever. And then to notice some forces that are ground with it, within it, that is actually negating it or shifting its ground, but people don't want to re recognize that. And then to look into these differences and towards some new order. It's not to stay at just the level of the routine. Yeah. It's a pity you didn't put a few examples in, it might have helped. Yeah. Well, he gives the example of the... So he starts out with giving the example of the... the between similarity and difference, mm -hmm. the, the, how you get from a line to a circle, to a spiral, to yeah. Brownian motion. And, and what you get is different similarities and similar differences. Yeah. And then he says there isn't such a thing as disorder absolute disorder, which is the same as the point about there isn't such a thing as pure manifold, because it couldn't be a pure manifold if it didn't have some kind of unity. So even, even the, what we call disorder is, when he, he says it's sort of this infinite, is a, is a, is a uh, what, what, what we experience as, as disorder is a kind of um, complex kind of order that is difficult to describe in full detail. And then he makes a distinction between orders and structures. And thus it can be seen that nature is a creative process in which not merely new structures, but also new orders of structure are always emerging. So the process takes a very long time by our standards. Um, and maybe that is, uh, that, that's the hierarchy yeah, that, that, uh, that you were talking about. So what does that mean for, after that, he then starts to discuss the notion of conflict and clash. We can have a well-defined order that is functionally wrong. Yeah, so he gives that example with the with the streets 
and uh, junction. Mm -hmm. And if you've got, so you've got um, the, the categories of streets and if a junction and a traffic light and everything is in order, but if that traffic light doesn't work, then you will have a collision of cars, perhaps people dying as part of the, the because of accidents, no. which means that there is a fault in the function of that order. Yeah, but it's still an order. Yeah. And that's it. That's the clash then. That's the clash. That's the clash, yes. Yeah. But doesn't it, at the moment when the traffic light doesn't work, does not everybody react differently to the fact that the traffic light doesn't work? Yeah, there doesn't have to be an accident. No. 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 But in in the case that it goes wrong in a negative way, in a not intended negative way, then that would be the clash or the conflict. Don't you have to imagine that the traffic lights um, don't stop working, but they're malfunctioning so that they're both on green at the same time? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> People just blindly follow their traffic lights. They, after the first accidents, I've been noticed. <laughs> yeah, no, they just keep on, keep, and the pile gets bigger and bigger. You know. So he then seems to be saying that um, there can be that is not just a subjective uh, perception that orders can be functionally wrong. Having seen that the perception of harmony and totality need not be a purely private kind of judgment, one can now understand in a new light the fact that the weak great scientists have, without exception, all seen in the structural process of nature a vast harmony of order of indescribable beauty. It seems likely that this perception was at least as valid as were those leading to precisely defined theories and formulae permitting the exact computation of some detailed characteristics of the properties of matter. And I think we can say that even with Kant, in a way, that is, that is true. You know? Whereas even in the, sort of in the third critique, there is the kind of idea that this perception of the world as a, as a somehow a unified beautiful whole, that that's, of course, within the, the boundaries of critical theory, is, is, has a kind of objectivity to it. Yeah? Um, what do you think of that? Is that, is that um, do you share that view? Or? But Kant also said, um, our reason can understand only what it creates according to its own designs. So there's, yeah. But on the other hand, it must also correspond somehow to reality. Yeah, but otherwise it wouldn't be. We, we can only understand our view of reality, perhaps yeah. it means. Yeah. Yeah, 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 of course, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. But if, but if, yeah, that's right. But if you take the three critiques together, although there is no theoretical, no sense of a metaphysical positive theory, there is no, no theory that would explain that the world is necessarily harmonious and beautiful, there is an ethical and an aesthetic imperative or postulate that makes us say that. Yeah. Yeah, but that's because it's internally generated rather than being external in the world perhaps. But it could that's right, but it could not not be. I mean he claims yeah. that it could not not be generated like that. Mm. Yeah. So it's not the fit it's not it's a, it's not the fact that we just happen to be moral creatures with understanding. It has to be that way. Yeah. Or not? Well, I'm just thinking, I mean, everybody thought that Newton's theory was wonderful when it came out, and then when Einstein came along, they said, well, that's even better. Yeah. So yeah. both of them were thought to be beautiful. So they're obviously... That's right, they're both are thought to be beautiful, yeah. Mm. And, but then we know about the, the fact that scientists use the category of beauty in making in making decisions uh, or making evaluating theories but of course you could say well that's purely private judgment it's interesting bringing Kant in the argument 
because to find out that there is a harmony with, with nature, which he doesn't do this until he goes to the third critique, yeah. is, is where you go beyond the conceptual. You go into reflective judgment. And in reflective judgment, you take talking about intuition. <coughs> that's, 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 that's not empirical intuition. It's, it's, it's prior prior intuition. So it's like seeing the whole. Yeah. And there is no concept to, to fit this intuition. And that's the pleasure of, of the beauty, that's the, the sense of the sublime, yeah. the sublime and so on. Yeah. So in a way, uh, I don't know how much he knows about Kant or all these German guys, but he could have pushed the argument that way. But he's always keeping it to the practical. He doesn't want to. He's not a philosopher. No. I, don't, I don't think he read Kant. No. Or anything. But, no. but I think he might have absorbed some of uh, Goethe and the Romantics and so on yeah. in, in the background because you get echoes of it. Yeah. But th this idea of the conceptual doesn't give you because the conceptual will give you, at the level of the understanding, you get just bits and pieces of reality. And, and this is the pure reason that takes you beyond the, this fragmentation of, of the understanding. So, so the, the ideas of reason are different than the concept of the understanding. Of course, yes. Because yes. The, the concepts of the understandings are clear cut. They give you just these fragments of reality, where the ideas gives you the totality of the experience. Yeah, but, but the idea remains... Regulative. Yeah, exactly. Regulative is not filled out completely, yeah? Yeah, but in this way, relative is the idea of harmony. So he, you see that you and nature share the same nature. Yeah. You, at, at bottom, you both want. So it's, it's away from we create in reality. Because we, we and reality are sort of, we and nature are in a bigger reality, which you could super sensible. So, and that's super sensible, we, uh, freedom and necessity uh, uh, get together, hang together as harmonious. But of course, the difference, the big difference with these kinds of theor theories is that here it is linked to the, fundamentally, to this notion of creativity, yeah. of learning something new. Well, and Kant as well, because you get the idea of the genius, and the genius would be created because because Kant uh, distinguishing art between the genius and any other artist. The genius is like is a point where he, he where the subjective and objective comes together. Yeah. He speaks the law, if you like, yeah. of nature. Yeah, yeah. Of the super sensible. Yeah, but this, this, that's different for notion of genius here. Yeah. Possibly, but. but but the, the similarity is that if you get the genius sets a style, for, for example, cubism, which he talks about, no. okay, the other artists come and copy this style, so they fall into the mechanical. Yeah. Well, but the first one who came with the vision is the genius. Yeah. So you might people have the skills in art, but not geniuses. Same with scientists. You have, you have. Genius scientists, and you have scientists. They just do their equations and so on. Yeah, and he is talking here about when he when he says originality, you could say that's what in the, in the Germans, the Romanticists called called genius. Yeah. yeah, the ability to have a direct intuitive perception of something new. And there's also Schiller's letter to Goethe where he says, uh, "Don't worry about philosophy. The philosophers are just." You know, they come afterwards and they put it all in conceptual straitjackets, but you have the direct intuition, so uh, that, that's yeah. what matters. Okay. And in some aspects, in, say, in Novalis, you find the idea the genius is the one who holds the synthesis. So he sees the contradictions, but he could work out the, the, the synthesis. Yeah. And but I think here the idea of the here the idea of originality goes goes maybe does go one step further because those notions of of the of the genius are 
are all, they seem to me to be all related to um, having a kind of uh, overall grasp of the totality and our place in it. And of course that's here too, but, but here it is more in the sense of realizing that there is the, an intuitive or in, ineffable yeah. connection to, to this wholeness and that every order that we develop is, is one possible way of, of, of expressing or manifesting it, but there could also be other ones. That seems to me to be slightly different. I don't know, but... Um, so you I see, the, the, see the, the, this, which you suggested in language, and this position of, of pairs coming yeah. together, yeah. which Novels talks about, you can produce all reality from plus and minus. Yeah. Uh, and the genius is who put all those plus and minus together. So it's like the, uh, before Hegel said that he uses the thesis, antithesis, and the synthesis. And he thinks you could do that. Uh, the one who could do that is the genius. Yeah, that's right. So, okay, well, that's a, that, it's a, but if, yeah, it's not quite clear to me yet if that is no. the same as what is happening here. Well, that's why I was struggling when I read it, yeah. trying to bring that notion, these notions together. I think it's more towards the practical, really, the implication of it. But he does say what what you just said about um, creativity is creating a genuinely new order, something that's genuinely yeah. new, as you as you describe what a genius yeah. does. And he does mention, I think in the first third of the, the essay, that taking a concept, an existing concept, and just applying it to a different field is not yet an original new order or concept. So exactly, I feel like exactly what you described before okay. would um, would apply here to my understanding. Yeah, that's, I think so too. Because the 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 the, the romantic genius is is still a contemplative genius. Maybe that's the, that's why you say the word practical. Yeah? So he's still concerned with. This is about escaping mechanical conditioning and yeah. embracing the new, as it were, and that puts you in touch with an intuitive understanding of wholeness. Well, they but that's different from that's different from the romantic genius who who gets a, a, an epiphany yeah. of the the totality and then controls the and the Faustian creation. Uh, a whole new order in the world. That's very different from from uh, from, what, from from what he says. At the end, he says, uh, uh, he talks about falling asleep, huh? and he says, uh, the mind lacks clear perception of area, an area that may be all subtle, does can no longer see what is creative and what is mechanical. Indeed, the mind then starts to suppress real originality and creation because these seem to threaten the apparently creative but actually mechanical center that appears to be at the heart of one's very self. Uh, well, this, this is the, uh, there's a, an, another discussion that precedes it, but apparent creativity, yeah? But the same definition you find there, the totality, wholeness, uh, beauty, harmony. Um, they, they all in the, in the romantics because they thought of doing philosophy poetically, yeah. doing science poetically. Yeah. And in fact, if, in the case of Novalis, he was mining engineer. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. He did a degree in philosophy as well, yeah. and uh, in law as well. And he thought of writing encyclopedia, yeah. uh, that all knowledge you can put it together in one frame. Yeah, but that's, that's not what this is. Oh, right. Okay, so, <laughs> excuse me, could yeah. you go over why? I mean, how Bohm is different from the romantic genius? Because I get lost now, like, after you... Okay, yeah, but precisely because this encyclopedic... Yes, so it, the, it, the, the status yeah. of the encyclopedia is different. There's still, there's a relation to wholeness here, to the wholeness as the implicate order, as he, as he calls it, mm -hmm. but that relation is established via 
learning to occupy this movement of learning something new, articulating a new order, and then somebody else articulates a new order, and 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 if you don't do that, you become you, you start to re mechanically repeat an order. Um, you start to see that as the core of yourself. Okay, I, I still miss that that crucial part. That there's a relation to wholeness as the implicate order, but it is established by what? It's established not via um, what you just said, <laughs> a, 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 a contemplative view of a totality. Mm -hmm. But it is established by, um, yeah, what I can't see it in other terms, then, then learning to see something new, learning to see something new okay. articulating a, a new perception in terms of a, a new order, and that is always a, a partial order. Yeah? I think that's important. It's always a partial order, but precisely because it is that, and you realize that it's your creation, as it were, that puts you in, in, in the process that, that the whole is. You, so every creation is a holographic, is itself a kind of holographic point. Um, but it's, but it is, it is, it is, you, you get it only when you s step into this, into this new. So we're also here trying to articulate a, a new conceptual order that's difficult to understand understand in terms of the of the old order and I think there are both parallels of course between the romantic uh, aesthetics and this but this seems to me to be different that that it it, it is uh, processual in a, in a more radical seems to be in a processual more radical sense it reminds me of uh, Jack Kerouac the, the, the beat writer who has this list of uh, of, of good advice about for, for people who want to write the rules for, uh, he calls it uh, principles of spontaneous prose it's also one of the texts for our seminar and one of those is um, you are a genius all the time <laughs> and that's not just uh, that's not just uh, uh, feel good uh, uh, speech, it's not motivational language you have to take that literally you are a genius all the time. That's what he says. Yeah. Yeah. You are a genius all the time, and you forget about it, or we, we fall asleep, but uh, it's always there. Um, I think... Uh, well, that's so the difference. The difference comes back to how you, you're being. Whether being actually is given, yeah. or it's process. Yeah. So there's the difference. Because if you thought being is given already in any form, then um, you can't get in touch with that being. But if it's being is in terms of process uh, or activity or creativity, then being itself is changing all the time. So you need to be creative at each time. So, so the total, totality would be not the same in every time. That's right, yeah. Check, yeah, you said that earlier, but that's, yeah, yeah. So, what exactly is I mean, Bond's uh, idea of genius in that case, versus the romantic genius? Sorry, is there the, the, a the, 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 the romantic genius, the romantic genius is a is a figure of exception. Yes, and is an exceptional Bond, person uh -huh. who who is able to 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 super to to rise above our normal antithetical way of thinking. And grasp the unity that is not conceptual, um, and then from there to 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 create uh, create the work of art. Whereas here, mm -hmm. the genius that he is talking about is is you know the learning how to walk. How? Learn. It's 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 everywhere. It's in every. Uh, it's in us all, and what we need to do is not so much. So it's not so much about rising to a level of exceptionality, but it's finding back, he says that also right at the end, finding back normality. <laughs> Does originality and creativity begin to emerge, not as something that is a result of an effort to achieve a planned and formulated goal, but rather as a byproduct of a mind that is coming to a more nearly normal order of operation? So it is a... 
It's like the Tao. It's uh, you know when you study, you gain every day. When you learn the Tao, you uh, you unlearn every day. <laughs> yeah, it's a re- it's a retreat. And this is the only way in which originality critics can possibly arise, since any effort to reach them through some planned series of actions or exercises is a denial of the very nature of what one hopes to achieve. And if you just in that song, doesn't it, I mean, doesn't it sound just like a Plato's uh, Minos? It no. It's already in that song. No, because it's not a remembering. It's not something that's already there. It's but learning it's a new. Us all. Huh? But yeah, it is in us all. It, it's in us all, yes. And in fact, probably, I would, he probably even goes further. It's, it's not just in us, it's in everything. That means that it is up to each person to make the first step for himself without following another or setting up another as his authority for the definition of what creativity is and for advice on how it is to be obtained. Unless one starts to discover this for himself rather than to try to achieve the apparent security of a well-laid-out pattern of action, he will just be deluding himself and wasting his efforts or his, his, his. To realize this fact is very difficult indeed. This is the, the philosophical lesson. To realize this fact is very difficult indeed. Nevertheless, one has to see that to determine the order in which one functions psychologically by following some kind of pattern is the very essence of what it means to be mediocre and mechanical. That is on page one, That's the end, 148. Okay. Yeah. And, and so, and then, yeah. Okay, so final point. The act of seeing this deeply, this what this originality and creativity is, and not merely verbally or intellectually, so to experience it, it puts it back to its experiential level, is also the act in which originality and creativity can be born. And then that follows from his implicate order, because once we see this, we connect to this, this force, we connect to this movement, moving process that is itself. Creativity is, like you said, it's, the, the yeah. totality is different now from what it was just now. Um, so that's what it means to say you're a genius all the time. Okay, it's time to stop at 6 o'clock, but um, I, I hope that what, uh, what this has, 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 has allowed us to do is to start to realize that thinking about creativity and spontaneity uh, does have some, some real implications for, for a lot of other things, and that there is something philosophically meaty about it that cannot just be reduced to categories that you already knew. Uh, so that we're trying to articulate a kind of uh, insight or, or conception of something that maybe is, is itself also uh, still, still new. And so next time we will then uh, continue this. I'll, I'll send out the, the pre-reading uh, for for it. Um, I, uh, I mean, I yeah, I haven't decided which. So is that do, I don't, we can do this together? If you have any suggestions okay. for yeah. what we should read next, then. Yeah. Well, yeah, we can, but. Uh, well, we've done it now. So okay. nice. But, Can but I just say, is it you said something earlier what? about spontaneous... I mean, maybe this is just an article, right? Uh-huh. It's, a ger- it's a journal article. Before was something... Somewhere. So maybe this is an extended... Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's not a lot of people. Spontaneous poetry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jack Carroll. It's a contradiction. Yeah, exactly. Spontaneous poetry. Prose, prose. Or prose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One second. Are you okay for me to send you the pre reading? Or yes. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry, what was that? Okay, you said what? The, the, the pre the reading for next time. Yeah, which one? Yeah, but we, I will send it. Yeah? I, I have we I have a list which is on our blog but I haven't okay. decided yeah. yet. Um, yeah. So no. we can explain the difference between the genius and the bomb bomb yes now. But it yeah. strikes me as like yeah. almost like a difference between yes. uh, yeah. a music uh, 
I mean, kind of like ever expansion of horizons, like for home, versus um, the romantic genius, which is like an epiphanic hold. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, so, so in other words, Holmes' method sounds more like the hermeneutic method yeah. of ever expanding yeah. your horizon. Yeah. Isn't that right? I mean, that's what makes it conceptual. It's certainly a, <laughs> a, a, certainly <laughs> a parallel. But, but, but actually, at the yeah, same time, this is precise and right. Mm -hmm. Mix uh, yeah. very large charges, gamma, for never having anything new. Yeah, 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 yeah of course. This is precisely, I mean, the construction is... Uh, <laughs> I agree with that. Yeah. From a new yeah. that there's nothing ever. Like, yeah, really, 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 yeah, I mean, so did Gadama. He also said that there's something really new. Yeah. But for, for Derry now, I mean, there's nothing no, absolutely new. I can understand, understand why he says that. Yeah. 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 So, so are there any differences between the Hermione yeah. method and Bob's method? I think so. I think there, there are lots of differences. Yeah. Like, like, for example? Well, we have to talk about that next time. Well, you have to. Okay. So you, but it's also, he, he says you should not try to reduce everything to something you already understand. You, so, but you have to go the other way. So you shouldn't always say, um, isn't this like Hegel or isn't this like Adam? Right? You should say, no, what is new? Yeah. That is precisely why I'm asking that question. So what is new here? <laughs> you have to think about it. I'm asking that, yeah. that precise question. Doesn't this just sound like from a new That's what I'm asking. I was asking that question precisely yeah, because I was troubled. Yeah. I mean, so yeah. what's the new Where's the new question? Yeah. Where's the new question? Yeah. 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 Well, we'll think about it, and next time we'll, we'll discuss okay. it. Okay. Thank you again.